Um, but uh, the show tonight is going to be sponsored by the Anyone Can Farm Homestead Hog Harvest class, which is coming up in about a month. It's about a month. That is going to be uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Let's see if I can find the exact dates. I should know, but every year it changes. So let's see. November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. So that's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The Anyone Can Farm Homestead Hog Harvest. We've been doing this a while. I think this is the 12th or 13th year. Let's see, 2010. So the 13th year. This is our 13th year. So this is going to be a lucky, lucky year. And uh, we allow 12 to 16 people to come. If we have a big push whole bunch of people want to come we'll allow 16 but normally it's just 12. Uh, we start friday after lunch uh, so have your lunch before you get here we do a little meet and greeting and then like 1 1 30 we're shooting the first pig so with 12 people we will shoot two pigs big mangalitsa pigs and then we will you know i do the shooting uh i do this the sticking, I stick the first one and then I hand it off to somebody uh, to do the second one. Uh, and then we we bring the pig over, we scald it, scrape it. It's very hands-on. And then do the evisceration. I instruct that first one. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I do a little bit of it, but then I'll hand it to somebody else and I'll say, go ahead and try it. And it's an environment where if somebody's going to do something dumb, I can stop them. Um, there's always people who want to lean forward on things, and there's always people who don't. If you're very new to this, then no one's going to push you. There's not going to be any peer pressure or anything like that. So it's uh, it's very self-regulated, and uh, you're going to be in with people who will travel to do something like this. And in my opinion... If you're going to be a successful homesteader, you got to be willing to do what others are not, right? And and processing of animals is it's it's not something I look forward to. You know, I would rather do plumbing than that. Um, but it's got to be done. And uh, without the ability to do this, then we're relying on someone else to do it for us. And that is what we're about in this homesteading vein, this vein of homesteading. I think we're like survivalist homesteaders. Uh, we want to be able to do everything ourselves. At least I do. I don't want to have to rely on anybody. And I've dealt with slaughterhouses for years. And uh, there's a lot of frustration with uh, slaughterhouses that I, I'm not willing to deal with anymore. And, and I, uh, I don't have to because I can do it myself. Uh, you put a lot of time into raising an animal, a lot of love, and then you are handing it off to the employees of the slaughterhouses, which they are the cheapest paid people going. And I don't quite get that. They don't pay good. And so they get people who generally are just there for the $10 an hour or 12 or whatever. And so they're not really too concerned with with your product, they're just concerned with getting through the day. And, you know, and when things change, uh, great, we'll go back to using them. But right now we haven't had very good luck with our, uh, our slaughterhouses. You know, I mean, it's hit and miss. Sometimes you get a perfect job, but then you'll get, you know, you won't get your meat back. And, you know, they, you, they could do better. And so when we do it ourselves, we do a really good job. And uh, anyone can do this. It doesn't mean that you have to have a lot of fancy equipment or anything like that. And uh, that's the point of the Anyone Can Farm Homestead Hog Harvest is to show you how little you actually need uh, to pull this off. Really, you need very little. Like you need a knife, a sharp one, probably a twenty-two would be good. If you don't have a 22, what do you have? If you have a, uh, 
a 3040 Craig or uh, an old 12 gauge, it'll work, you know. Uh, and as you progress into this and you start to understand that, yeah, I didn't like doing it, but I know I need to know how to do this. As you progress into it, then you, I have people calling me on the phone and saying, hey, so I'm going to buy a gun. What should I get? And I'll just say, hey, well, this is what I use. And that's what I'm going to use during the class. I use a 22 Magnum, by the way. I used just a regular 22 for years. And uh, I needed a new rifle uh, because the rifle I was using was actually my son's. It was my son Joe's. And he's living with his wife on, at his residence. So that gun needed to go to him. So I need to get a new one. And Ruger had a nice little 22 uh, Magnum. It's a American rifle, and it was reasonable, and it was new, and uh, so I nailed it. And that gun has been a dream. The only thing I use it for is shooting pigs and cows and stuff. I mean, it stays. Sometimes it stays in my Jeep for long periods of time, so it gets rained on and everything else. And uh, but it's a good, dependable gun. Anyway. I, I rabbit trailed. I rabbit trailed. You guys are in for it tonight because I had coffee. I had coffee. I had a wicked good day. Wicked good day. Um, so that's ho Homestead Hog Harvest. We we start with live pigs, and by Sunday afternoon, you are stuffing sausage casings. You are hanging hams. You are making bacon. You know, all the things in between. There's a lot of steps in between. We've condensed it down to a half a day on Friday, full day Saturday, long day Saturday, Sunday till about three. And if you got to get going sooner than that, then that's so be it. Um, but we feel as though there's enough information there so that the next weekend you could go home and you could get it done on your own, um, but not so much information that it's like, ah, it's too much, too much, right? We try to keep it doable and uh, we've had pretty good luck. We've had many people that have come through the class and then they've gotten back to us. Yep, went home, got her done. Um, just had a guy just recently, uh, Marion Leninger that sent pictures on Facebook of him and his wife doing it. And it's a few years after the fact. And I don't know if they did it before, but she she just called me recently and she said, okay, we got a 22 Magnum. What kind of bullet should we use? Ooh, good question. Because all bullets aren't designed for every situation. You know, it there's there's uh there's nuances to bullet design and killing, actually. I hate to say that, but there really are. It's not like uh, TV, bang, ooh, it's not that way. And when you're shooting pigs, you, you want them to go down immediately, right? And so the correct bullet is very, it's imperative to use the correct bullet. All right, so... Um, that's this show tonight is sponsored by the Anyone Can Farm Homestead Hog Harvest. Okay, and let's see who do we got with us. We got Brian Jacobs with us. Wow, celebrity time! I went to uh, a thing called a bear meetup this weekend here in northern Michigan. It was at a friend of ours' house, and uh, you know the Owen Benjamin people. They have the bears. And I'm not really part of the group, but I, I listen to Owen once in a while, and I may have said something on this show about it. Um, he's fun to listen to so, sometimes. He can be a little wild. But uh, I went to that Saturday. It was really cool. A lot of people there. Had a fun time. Um, today, I was, today was my day to milk, me and Frank. So that's what we started the day off by milking. We are milking five cows right now. We've got a nice little setup. And so milking is, you got to milk the cows. We have uh, a uh, bucket milker, and we've just built a new 
milk parlor for the cows to be in to be milked and it's new and improved and it makes things a lot easier and then when we take the milk out we have to run the milk through a strainer and run it right into jars which if anybody's got any of our jars i want them uh, we run it into jars and then we cool the milk really quickly in a uh a water bath cooler and then the jars go into the fridge the refrigerator that we cool the milk on and uh we're doing a pretty good job with our our raw milk business it's it's going really well i i highly recommend it um even for people who don't have a lot of land um hay is very reasonable always has been even when they say it's going to be so expensive this year it's really not. It's like when people say, oh, gasoline, it's so expensive at $3.50 a gallon. You know how far you can go on $3.50 on $3 of worth of, of gasoline? How far you can go on a gallon of gas? Try walking it, and then you'll see that, well, I guess it's not really that much. It's not really that much, right? You can go a long ways on a gallon of gas if you have the the right setup you know if you want gas cheap enough so you can just be driving a gas hog around you know then you're going to have to live with it but uh gas really is cheap and if you go to europe they sell it it's a lot more expensive all right so we've got wow a lot of people with us great Sarah at Hold the Line Homestead. This is the first time I got notification of my life. Oh, well, that's great. Welcome. McKenna Hicks. Hey, Mark, can't wait to hear your words of wisdom for the week. All right. Listic, phone is watching, so just say cheese with that wine. Yeah, Kaleidoscope Junkie. Hey, it's been a while. Good evening. Channels like this one is the only reason I am still on the Internet. Oh, thanks a lot. That's nice. That's nice. Hope we can stay on. Isn't that the weekend daylight saving ends? I don't know. I don't know. Dave and Sonia. Hey, we got that thing. Finally, that dehydrator. So I wonder why you guys haven't come camping here in the in the fall. You really should. And then we can just talk about dehydrators for a long time. Belva's with us. I think Belva's coming to the... Uh, Hog harvest. She threatened to anyway. You should, Belva. Listic Mystic. October. October. That must be something that I'm supposed to dig. I don't know. Okay, it's like Brian's saying, it's like the real world with blood. Met great people in these. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Homestead Hog Harvest. It is fun. I mean, I it's the high point of well one of the high points of my year i really have a good time we always have really cool people that show up so if you're not cool don't even bother coming all right evening to abundant living health and wellness coach that's my lovely wife oh the copperhead is here so i shouldn't talk about certain things they don't like it when i encourage other people to get into milking Sorry, I already did it. <laughs> but uh, Milken's going great. And Mike H is with us. That must be Mike Hunter. I was thinking about you today for some reason. And Mike Cronk just, just sent me a text, said we're tuning in. All right, cool. And Dion's with us, the cradle robber. I found out about you today. All right, well, great. Um I there's uh, there's somebody that's in the tribe. It, okay, if you're not in the if you're not a member of the tribe, the tribe is a Facebook group. It's the Anyone Can Farm Tribe, and Facebook is a good place to have a meetup. And then we encourage people to post things on there. Okay, Mike Hammonds. Um. We we encourage people to post things on there of what they're doing. So let's say that you're just getting chickens and, and you're really geeked about it and you post your chickens and you talk a little bit, a bit about it and ask a question. Let's say you're going to have a bunch of people 
that have just gotten chickens for the first time that are going to relate to you, right? Where I've had chickens for a long time. I love my chickens, but I'm not getting super excited about chickens anymore. Well, maybe I am. Um, so the tribe is a really good place because you, you can meet up people who are at the same place as you are. And there are people here that are more, um, uh, more advanced, I would say. There's definitely, there's definitely a, a, a starting point and an advancement along the way. I mean, if you don't have a homestead, and then you buy a big chunk of land and then all of a sudden you get cattle on there like okay but you're going to have a pretty steep learning curve uh, i'm not saying don't do it but uh usually people start at one level and work their, their way up but of course you can do what you want i'm not here to say there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it i'm not i'm trying to be not dogmatic about things like that and we have Covington with us. If I can make it to hog harvest, do I still have to put in four hours on Saturday morning? <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. And quit fooling around. I don't want to hear it. You should come, Covey. It'd be, it'd be a good time. It'd be good to see you. Your name comes up all the time around here. And I'm... I regret how remiss I have been in sending you photographs because if I was you and I'd been through what you went through last summer, it would just be really neat to see things all the time. Be really cool. I think, um, yeah. And we need to talk about interns too. We need to talk about that for next year, if that's going to work out because we got to start doing a little bit of, you know, the P word planning got to start doing that if it's not it's not but if it is i think it could be a really good thing and I, I believe we could get people from the tribe who would like to intern at you know the best farm in the united states there's no doubt about it i've seen the videos the milking parlor looks great yep and you you must have seen that face is still here um, for those of you that uh, don't know, we have a cow named Face, and that came because uh, she's got a big stripe on her face, and we have another cow that has stripes on her body, and we call her Stripe, and when this one came here, it was Stripe Face, and it just got shortened to Face, and now everybody calls her Face, and she had a stinking attitude for a while, and she kicked Covey, but good. She got me good too. And when she got me, she had gotten everybody else. And I finally made the decision she can't be here. So we were going to burger her. And I was uh, just waiting a few, just waiting a little while until I settled with the decision. And, and I thought, well, you know, I didn't hate her. She was just kicking. And someone, it was actually Joel Salatin, had said that you should uh, milk a cow from the right. And I was, I even publicly said, yeah, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, who cares which side, you know, you get on a horse from the left side. But I just, I tried milking her from the right and I had no problem. And she gives really nice milk. She's turned into a really nice cow. We really, you know, she was, she was at the edge of being hamburger. And now she's providing us with a lot of really nice milk. So it's, uh, it's kind of a thing, you know, with face. <laughs> yeah. Covey rolled his ankle and it wasn't getting better. He was, I thought he was just being a wuss. Um, but then when she kicked him it pushed it back in place and he was like hey she she's a, she's a, a chiropractor she fixed me okay keith is with us just got in from work all right cool okay so um somebody from the tribe um brooke 
actually, Brooke Judd asked if I would talk about uh, composting. And um, she did it kind of publicly. And I said, yeah, I would and stuff. And they just came here um, from the service, Navy, but still service people. And um, they're trying to get a homestead going. And I haven't been to their place yet, but I know it's close by. And I've heard a little bit about it from them as far as what's growing on it and stuff. And, you know, they, they're not hiring me for consulting. So I don't like to butt in. If you ask me what to do, I'll tell you. But if you don't, you know, it's I'm going to mind my own business. I'm not going to tell anybody what to do. But if you're if you ask for consulting, if you pay for consulting and you're doing something stupid, I will slap you on the back of the head and say, don't do that. That's dumb because not everything is productive in homesteading. No, it isn't. It's just reality. I mean, you know, I, people don't like to hear that. You know, I want to raise ponies on my homestead and I want to not have to go to work. Well, I'm sorry, that's not going to work especially rainbow ponies. It's not doable. There's certain things, the way the world is now, at least, um, that's not going to work. So when people are doing stuff and uh, they're, they're hiring me for consulting, I will, I will give them the, the brutal truth about what they're doing or not doing. But anyway, in this case, she said, would you talk a little bit about composting? Because uh, I told her that the first thing you really need to do is get a handle on the fertility around there. If, if you don't have fertile ground, um, you know, that would be one of the things that I would say, no, you need to do this and it needs to be a priority. So, okay, how do we do this? How do we do this? Now there's, there are companies around that make compost and they make it in, at an industrial scale. And then they inject things into it that when you put it on your garden, wow, you get a kick out of it. But you can buy miracle Grow and you can put that on your garden and you'll get a kick out of it too. But is it going to work for the long run? Well, the answer there is, is absolutely not. Wh who would create a product that you use once and you never have to use it again? Like that, that company would go out of business. That's not good marketing. It's like if you're a cigarette company and you make a, the best cigarette there ever was, it's just a beautiful cigarette and it comes in packs of one because when you smoke that cigarette, that's it. You don't need to ever smoke another cigarette. No, they make them so that you smoke it and then couple hours later, it's like you have a craving for another one. And then a couple hours later, another one. And so you buy a pack and then you have to buy another pack and then another pack. That's that's marketing, marketing 101. That's why it's so successful. Cigarettes, really, they make a lot of money off cigarettes. They just roll up weeds in a, in a piece of paper and people smoke it. Not for me, but people do. And it's a you can make a lot of money in that. Like, uh, that's why they have the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. It's because it's profitable. Anything <clears throat> that the government gets involved with and they're going to regulate it, it's because it's profitable. Not because they care about your health. <clears throat> alcohol is profitable. That's why you can't make your own. <sighs> Look at that. <clears throat> it's just water. So um, anyway, I, I made a video and I, I said in composting, it's a circle. It's the circle of life. It, it, the composting program is a, it's a mirror of the circle of life. Is that the word I'm looking for? It's a, um, A mirror of the yeah okay we'll we'll go with that one because I can't think of another word <clears throat> if somebody can help me um, and so the way it works around here 
is I have five milk cows. I have um, 10 uh, beef cows. And I use, I have two groups of beef cows. I have the young ones and the ones that are going to be two years old. And then I will add five more this year after we butcher the ones that we're going to butcher this, this winter. And so we keep doing that. So we've got five cows coming on all the time. And then I do a few other, a few other cows of other people's that I buy, I buy the cow and then I butcher it. And then we can, you know, if it's a, if it's good beef, we can sell it. And, um, but the milk cows have a place called the loafing shed where they go in after they're, they're milked, they've eaten their grain and they just want to lay in there, relax, chew their cud and manure. That's what they do. So it builds up with manure. I bet it, I go in there with straw and I, I spread straw out so they'll lay on it. And, uh, then periodically you got to get in there with the, the loader a tractor with a bucket on the front and, and scrape that all out. And then I make a pile of it. And then usually I move that pile with my truck over to the composting area. And that's over by where Covey was living. And the compost pile needs to be aerated periodically. So you can do it as much as every day. If you want, you can just pick it up with the loader and, and dump it and air gets in it. And it's real fun because it, it steams in the morning. And, uh, what that is, is the microbiology that's in that. A lot of it comes from the bedding that I put down. A lot of it comes from the cows, from their internal, you know, micro microbiome, uh, some of it comes from the grass that the cows are eating. Some of it comes from the, the small amount of grain that they get to entice them in. Some of it's absorbed out of the air. Uh, some of it comes down with the rain, right? Some of it just migrates in because it's a good place to live. If you're a microbiological, you know, organism, um, it, it's like crossing the border from Mexico. You're coming into the land of milk and honey. You know, come to the United States. There's food. There's plenty of stuff to do. There's, you know, there's Dr. Phil. There's uh, Oprah Winfrey. There's all that good stuff. That's why they come. That's why they come to the United States. I, I don't blame them. They don't have Oprah down there in Mexico. So um, all of those microbiome that's in the compost... Uh, we are supplying them with food and and we'll put some water on that compost pile if we have to. We'll turn it to aerate it. And as time goes by, it reduces down and it becomes stable. And all those microbiological uh, entities that are in there, they'll go kind of dormant in the wintertime. And then they'll start back up in the spring. But hopefully in the spring... We've got a, a program together where we can get that stuff spread out on the field. And what we're doing is we're adding microbiological entities, little little tiny animals, bacteria, amoebas, protozoa. Um, oh, there's all kinds of things. I mean, really a lot, like thousands of different things. Um, nematodes, nematodes, all kinds of things. We're adding that to the garden, maybe. We can add it there. We can add it to a, like a vegetable garden. We can add it to a flower garden. We can add it to our lawn. I've done that, and we have tremendous results. Uh, and today, I spread about 18 yards of it, is what I figure I had, on my top field. And my top field was, uh, it was, it was struggling. It was struggling for sure. I mean, in the past we'd spread a lot of compost on it and it had done a really nice job, but because of where the field is, there's so much sand underneath it that it just drains really fast. And anytime we have uh, droughty weather, that field is the first to take a beating. And now, as the steward of this property, I can, uh, it, it's within, it's fair for me to do whatever it takes 
to make that field productive. It's fair. All is fair, right? So I could, for a temporary fix, I could go and I could buy chemical fertilizer, petrochemical fertilizer. I could buy that. And uh, then you go out there and you spread it. For a field that size, I priced it one time and it was over $1,000 that it would have cost. And that field produces around, uh, at, at its peak, I think I've gotten 22 bales off of it. So that's, let's say a bale is uh, 1,000 pounds, which they're not. They're about 750 pounds. But let's say a bale is worth 100 bucks, and you get 20 of them, two grand, right, worth of hay. Uh, and I'm putting $1,000 worth of comp of uh, petrochemical fertilizer on it so see you see the problem there so i've got an overhead that i have to deal with and i don't want that i don't want that and a lot of farms uh they would never think of doing anything else than putting fertilizer on they wouldn't think of it because that's just the way it's been done for for forever when fertilizer was discovered um, you know, once they used it, it was like, wow, look at this. But what's happened over the, the time that it's been discovered, actually, it came out after World War II. Because a lot of what we were using for munitions, for bombs, they didn't have a use for anymore. And so they said, well, I don't, let's try putting it on the field. And they did uh, a lot of nitrogen and it gave a real kick. And, but the problem is it's toxic to the nematodes and the protozoa and the bacteria and the earthworms and all the other uh, organisms that live out in that field. So you may get a kick out of it, but the next year you've knocked the life in that field down so far that you don't have much choice. Maybe not the next year, but the year after that, you don't have a choice. You're going to have to use that fertilizer again. So. I never want to get it. I never wanted to get caught up in that of using fertilizer and then feeling like, well, if I want to harvest this year, I'm going to have to put some fertilizer on. I don't want to do that. So we went the other way and started collecting manure. Uh, that particular field, I collected manure from an Amish farm about a mile away. He had piles and piles and he had actually asked me if I would haul some of it just to get rid of it because he didn't he didn't know what to do with it. And I had my uh, big red truck. Um, it's a dumper. It'll it'll hold 10 yards. And so they were loading it and I was driving it over here and dumping it. And I made rows. I hauled so much manure off that place. I, I felt at first like I was getting taken advantage of. But then I started to realize, hey, wait a minute, compost is worth something. And then I started researching compost. And he started to kind of wonder why I was so uh, so willing to just work like that and haul his refuse off. And when I told him, he was like, well, I'm going to have to get something for that then. And after a while, he kept bumping it up, bumping up to where if hauling a load of manure off of there was worth he was wanting more for the manure than it would have been worth if it was finished compost. That's that's Amish 101. You know, if they they figure out you're doing something that you're making money on, they're they can do it cheaper. So, uh, but but I did get probably about 300. I figured about 300 yards that I hauled off of there. So that would have been 30 loads, yeah. And uh, composted it all down and then spread it, the majority of it, on the top field. And then disked it down and replanted it. And uh, that field, wow, did it produce. And it continued to produce. It wasn't requiring any maintenance. And then we had a droughty year and I didn't cut it. Uh, and the next year after that, I cut it and it wasn't so good. Got maybe seven, 10 bales off it. Then last year I didn't cut it again. I uh, took uh, Parker's advice and I just started grazing the cows on it. 
And this year it was looking much better. So what we are doing is we're mimicking nature. When I graze cattle on that field, I'm, I'm putting a bale up there, a round bale, with a, a bale ring on it. And then the cows go up there and they eat. They stand around the bale ring feeder. They manure. They walk around, eat some of the grass, and then they manure. And <clears throat> at the end of the season last year, we started to see where the manure piles were. Uh, a lot of fertility around the edges of that manure pile. That's what you'll see. And then this spring, when the when the spring flush came on, you see a much bigger ring of fertility around that manure pile. And then you start to see that fertility ring hooks up with other fertility rings. And you see big patches of really nice grass. So what we're doing when we have a compost program is we're mimicking that we're mimicking that and we can mimic that without having the cows out there that are eating the grass because our goal is to cut the field roll it up in hay bales and put it in the barn so we can feed it in the winter time okay i'd rather graze in the summertime because it's it's hands off. I mean, I've got cows out on the field that if if somebody hadn't left the gate open yesterday, I wouldn't have actually seen them face to face. I know they're out there, but I don't see them for long periods of time because they're just out and they graze and then they lay down and they're just very happy people just eating like buffalo, wandering, eating buffalo style. So I, and it doesn't cost you anything. When you got to feed bales, it's it's costing you, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about the compost pile. So I talked about, okay, I moved the manure over there. The manure's got bedding in it. Bedding would be straw, wood chips, anything that is carbon-based. If you shredded cardboard, you could use that. Um, I'm careful because it's going to be added to the, uh, the field and if there's glue or anything like that on it that I don't know what it is, I'm not going to fool with it. And it's, I got too much organic stuff available to me that I don't need to fool with stuff like that. But I suppose if you lived in the city or not so out in the sticks or you just didn't have the connection, you might have to do that. You know, think about If you're putting newspaper down, is it is it organic? Well, it's got ink on it, I think. I don't know. They always say don't use the shiny pages. Okay, but the other ones are okay. I don't know. I don't do it, um, but I'm not saying don't do it. I, I just choose to use uh, straw and, uh, and wood chips. You know, if you can find the guys that are chipping along the power lines and you can get them to dump on you, take all they can give you. I mean, it's, that's really good stuff. And there's a lot of nutrient in that because trees pull up trace minerals from down deep in the soil. So you're getting more than you think with that. Now, once you wrap your head around this composting thing and what a huge force multiplier it is to you, you become a fiend for organic carbon-based materials. You see them and you want them. <laughs> and it's really cool because the, the non-tribal uh, world out there, like they see a pile of manure as just a pile of manure. They don't see it for what its value is. Okay, so I moved on my compost pile. Uh, what else was in the compost pile besides manure and bedding? Well, uh, my chicken house that I just built, I think last summer, yeah. Uh, I chose to build it on a concrete floor. Why? Because I want that chicken manure. What do chickens do when they're sitting on their perch at night? Manure. If it's falling on a floor that is hard to clean, not concrete, it's hard to get it. 
And sometimes I used to be like this. No, I'd rather have it be like that because then it goes back to the earth and I don't have to deal with it. But the manure, if you have a composting pro program like I do, it's like, no, I want that. I don't want the earthworms to get that. I want it for me. So I'll rake that, that house out and I'll shovel it into the bucket and I'll take that over and I will put that in the compost pile. Ooh, nitrogen right there. Nitrogenic compost pile is like, gimme, gimme. Uh, we have a chicken processing business. So we butcher chickens like professionally. And one of the byproducts of butchering other people's chickens is feathers. So, and wet feathers, you know, all kinds of different chickens. And uh, once you get them all scooped up, it, the water that's on the floor and all that stuff goes in with it. And there's a lot of manure in there that goes in the front end loader that goes over to the compost pile. I, I pull it open, the steam comes billowing out and then I dump wet feathers in there, push it closed. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. It's a beautiful thing. I might seem like a geek, but I'm, I'm better off getting geeked about composting than probably I don't know. Golf. Uh, anyway, so uh, the compost pile has all of that in it. Then um, we have a population of people that doesn't see the value of organic materials. So they'll actually buy bags from Home Depot. They buy bags from Home Depot and then they stuff all their yard refuse that they get out there and they rake it all up and everything. It's got sticks and leaves and everything. And then they'll put it in these bags and they leave it out for the trash man. You can just drive by and pick it up. They don't care who picks it up. You know, I don't, I've never had anybody say, you can't take that. That's for the trash man. What do they care? It's gone. You don't care. Chips from electric company only do not get chips from private tree company they take down diseased trees i'm going to talk about things like that kaleidoscope i want to talk about things like that right here okay you're going to get a whooping um so you become a fiend when it comes to or organic material Whenever you see it, it's like, yeah, I want that. Um, you start asking the question, well, what else could I put in there that would make it work even better? Um, I went yesterday and I bought 500 pounds of pelletized lime. Really nice smelling stuff, pelletized. Uh, I've used it before. It's all organic. Um and I, I put that in the pile and I mixed it up as good as I can. Why? Because the field's always going to need lime. It, it doesn't generate its own um, calcium. You, you need to add that. When, I'm, when I put bones in the compost pile, I'm doing that too, right? So anything I can put in that compost pile that's going to help my field, I will do it. And we started uh, this talk off with with biochar and and i've said before biochar is probably one of the greatest force multipliers in homesteading and it's right there with composting if you if you couldn't do composting you should do biochar but if you can do them both then you're really in business it's sort of like if you owned a zoo, um, you could you could have the zoo and no animals, or the zoo with animals. So a zoo with animals is going to be way better than a zoo with all the cages and the popcorn and everything, but no animals, right? I don't know if that's a good one, but uh, it seems like it to me. But the the two things go hand in hand. Why? Because biochar is charcoal that's made in a oxygen deprived environment and there's a lot to know about making biochar but there's a lot of information on the internet you can find out or you can 
take one of our classes. You can come and see it done here. And uh, you can even buy biochar from us, but we don't sell it in great quantities. We sell it in feed quantities, you know, for chickens. Um, and what biochar does, because it's an oxygen deprived environment that the charcoal is made in, is there is no distillates in the charcoal. And the distillates would be things like varnish and creosote. Um, and then there's just a myriad of other things that you want out of that charcoal. Like if you picked up lump charcoal from the store and you smelled it, mmm, it smells like campfire. And that is not what you want. Although if that's all you can get, it's better than nothing, I would say, I believe. Um, <laughs> But if you can get biochar, that's even better. And biochar, when you smell it, it doesn't smell like anything. I'm actually smelling my hands. I smell my hands. I don't smell biochar. I don't, you know, I smell, I smell my neighbor. You know, I don't smell the biochar. But that's because there's nothing in it. It's pure carbon. And pure carbon doesn't smell like anything. It doesn't taste like anything either. Biochar has got some really uh, unique properties we crush it up we put it in compost but we also put it in the feeds if you look at biochar under the microscope you're going to see an apartment building that's cut in half you see all these empty spaces in there and those spaces are where the microbiology can seek refuge and they can get away from dryness wetness heat and cold they can get away from all those things so when you use biochar it preserves the microbiology that microbiology whether you know it or not you have about three pounds of it in your own gut your gut goes from here to here and when you eat something it's the microbiology that's in your gut that breaks the food down and makes it available for your your body to use and it's the same thing in a compost pile, it's the same thing in a chicken's gut or a pig's gut or a cow's gut. So if we can put the biochar in, it'll preserve the, um, the microbiology in your gut when it comes out because that's very valuable to us. So you'll notice if you ever come here for an event, we have an outhouse. And it's more of a, it's a Baker's Green Acres outhouse. And it's not really an outhouse because an outhouse is just a big hole in the ground. And the manure goes down there and it just, all the manure is down there and it's churning around and it's just going back to the earth. Like it's designed to, things go back to the earth. But we intervene. We put a bucket there with, with uh, sawdust in it. And then we use biodegradable toilet paper well all toilet paper is biodegradable and then when that bucket is full i take it out of there and by then you're gone and you don't even know you left a sample you left us a really nice biodiverse uh sample of your biology you know from you could be from muskegon you know and your biology is going to be different because where you live is different than our and what you eat and who you come in contact with and all that stuff now i know somebody's going to say something it's probably going to be kaleidoscope junkie that's going to say it yeah but what if the person is taking pharmaceuticals you want pharmaceuticals on your on your uh uh your field you know one of no the if, if somebody was here that has taken uh, pharmaceuticals, let's say, and they filled that bucket, and then I took that bucket to my compost pile, which when I moved it, it was 18 yards. That is a lot of compost. A full bucket of pharmaceutical-laden manure from some person that's here they would have to be here for six months to fill it. Um, well, maybe not six months. That's still just a very small 
portion of their manure and even a smaller portion of the pharmaceuticals, right? Because most of what's in a pharmaceutical pill is fillers. You know, the chemicals that is screwing with your brain is very, very tiny. A lot of it stays in your brain. So I'm not really worried about that. I'm not worried about it. And we've been doing this a long time, and I always empty the outhouse into the compost pile. I've always done that. And I've never seen anything happen. I've never seen any of the animals uh, have a psychological reaction because they got a little bit of, I don't know, somebody's on something or other. I've never seen anything happen. Now, there's always somebody that's going to say, yeah, well, you don't want to do that. Uh, because it could, and, and it sounds good, right? But think about it. The solution to pollution is dilution. It's so diluted. How can it possibly have an effect? So you just, I think you got to think about these things. Okay, so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to beat up on you here a little bit, Clyde. So it says, you said only do it from the electric company because private companies cut down diseased trees. So the electric company, if there's a tree that's in the way of the power lines and it's diseased, they don't cut it down. And if they did, I, I, I don't want to beat you up too bad, but if they did, you've got a tree that is diseased, right? Let's say it's got uh, chronic or Dutch wilt or something like that, that didn't come from Venus. That's been on planet Earth for a long time. And it's by design. It's part of the design. We have all these Dutch elms and they have their heyday and all of a sudden they all die. And if no one was in the woods to see them die, you wouldn't even know that they died. They, they would fall over and then they would rot and they would become part of the forest floor. So if they're in our compost pile, isn't aren't they doing the same thing? I say that they are. And uh, if I was going to go with what you're saying, I would have to say to the, the guys that trim the power lines, yeah, but no diseased trees. And I'm sure those guys know a diseased tree when they see one because they're experts, right? No, I don't, I don't buy into that. I think... Um, if a tree is needing to be cut and it's diseased, once it goes in the compost pile, whatever the disease is, um, I don't think my cows are going to catch the, a disease that affects trees. I don't. I just, I just don't. And I, I, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because some people's minds work like that like i see on the internet all the time you know we have the the tribe page and i don't interact on there with everything because i, I can't and and i don't think you really want you know me to be given my two cents on everything i let other people do stuff but um a lady asked the other day about feeding acorns to mangalitsa pigs and somebody chimed in that if you feed too many acorns to a mother pig, it affects her fertility and she won't get pregnant. Where did you hear that? Where did you hear that? And I mean, think about it, will you? Just think about it. What is there in an acorn that's going to affect the fertility of a pig? And, and I, and I got to say that maybe if somebody had said something like this to me 20 years ago, we've been here 19 years. And when I moved here, uh, I was good friends with Jill's grandfather. He was still alive then. And we were at his house kicking around. He's got these beautiful oaks in his front yard. Did They sold the house. But... And they dropped these acorns that are about the size of a, a big grape. And if you park out there, bang off your car, they'll break your windshield because they're real high trees. So the acorns, of course, you know, they reach terminal velocity very quickly. And I said to him, Jesus, too bad you can't do something with these things. You know, and he says, I don't know. I don't think you could feed them to pigs. They're too bitter. And I just, you know, he's an old guy and he'd been farming all his life and the, 
I just kind of shrugged my shoulders and yeah, yeah, pigs wouldn't eat them, would they? They're just too bitter. <laughs> then we find out that pigs do eat them. And the bitterness of the acorns is actually the tannic acid that's in there. And if you know anything about tanning hides, you can take a bunch of acorns and you can mash them up and then you put water in there and you drain that water off and that is going to be laden with tannic acid and you can use that to tan a deer hide right so when we feed those acorns to the pigs the tannic the tannins the tannic acid gets into their their fat and then their fat will resist rancidity same as a deer hide would resist going bad you know because of the tannins and then we can take that that leg of of uh pork that we've just killed and we can just put a little salt on the bone and hang it in our hanging room and it'll be you know we can serve that in 25 years yeah so and that's been done for for ages and you got you look at that system of hanging hams and it's like you know you'd swear somebody kind of planned it that way <laughs> but why would they you know of course it was to benefit mankind that's you know we weren't born with refrigeration uh, and people hung hams for years they hung hams bacons and ham hocks and everything and then they would smoke them too, but generally they smoked stuff in the warmer months when the flies were out. That's why they did smoking. Yeah. Okay. Uh-oh, I see something I don't like. Okay. Kaleidoscope. Oh, Faye's with us, my daughter-in-law. Um, Kaleidoscope saying, people who board horses will give away betting. Some have loaders on certain days. Okay. Chips from electric company only. Do not get chips from private tree company. They take down disease trees. Okay, well, I think I addressed that. Bingo. Dilution is the, is the savior. Kaleidoscope. Mine goes to black soldier fly composting. Okay. Stark Raving Ranch says those pharmaceuticals products will totally decompose at the warm temp of a good pile, right? My friend has a huge rust problem from private chips. Okay, well. Okay. I, I won't. Then people will have to decide what they want to do. But I, what, power companies don't take down disease trees? I mean, if a disease tree is growing in front of the power lines, I'm sure they're going to cut it down. They're not going to say, well, we don't take down disease tree. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I have a big chemistry and pharma background, and none of the pharma compounds will survive the sustained 130 degree centigrade temps of a good compost pile. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. So that with the dilution is going to hook us up. It's going to keep us in the safe zone. Okay, Crunchy Mama Farms is with us. Sean Wise is with us. Way late. I'll be watching tomorrow. Okay, Sean. And Sean Kelly. Okay, so uh, the compost pile, I, I, I hauled it out to the field I wanted to apply it to. I spread it out a little bit. And then I put 500 pounds of lime on it, and I put 15 pounds of seed on it. So I went to the co-op to see what they had for seed. A lot of times when I go there, they have good deals on seed. And they're usually selling small quantities of seed, like five pounds, to guys who want to plant it out in the woods for deer to come in. They call them food plots. So, uh, you know, sometimes they, 
they don't sell them all in the fall or summer. So the next year they mark them way down and that's when I scoop them up. And if the seeds look good and you can bite a seed and it's still kind of squishy on the inside, it's still good. Right. And, um, so anyway, I got 15 pounds of seed. Um, they wanted full price for it. So it was like 40 bucks and I didn't want to go too crazy, but I got, um, and this is part of the composting problem, uh, program. This is, this is, this is knowledge that goes along with it because we're composting to enhance the growth of either our garden, our flower garden, or our lawn or our hay field. And so how else can, what can we do? Well, we're going to be spreading that compost. Can we kill two birds with one stone? So I say yes. So I mixed in 15 pounds of seed with it and I used clover, two different types of clover and some Timothy. Grass. So, uh, about seed, the Timothy grass that is growing out there could have come from a different part of the country. Who knows where this come from? I asked the lady at the register and she said, right? Like she, she, there's no way she could know. And even the bag could say, well, this was bagged in, um, I don't know, Baltimore, Maryland, but who, who knows where the seed came from? So when I put seed into the compost pile, uh, I'm putting it in an environment where if the compost and the seed land close together, it stands a good chance of, or a, a fair chance maybe of germination. And then it's on the ground and maybe there's something close by that can help it along. And, you know, maybe you get another species of grass growing out there. You should have on a, a hay field, you should have you know, multiple species. You don't want to have a, a, a single species uh, because they they work in unison. It's sort of like that commercial they used to have on where they'd show a lady playing a flute and then there'd be a, a guy next to her, you know, a fat bald guy and he's playing a clarinet. And then a guy's there that's playing a drum and all these pieces come in and then it sounds really good. It's a symphony. So you want a symphony of plants on your field because they do complement each other in their growth. Of course, the more species you have out there, the more aggressive you need to be in providing them with what they need. So the compost pro program works hand in hand with seed procurement on the field, adding seed to what? The, the, the seed bank that's out there, right? When you go out onto your field, and let's say you take a shovel and you pull it to the side and you, you, you're looking at bare dirt right there. And then you walk away from that. What is going to happen if it's, I got a dog sleeping there that snored. Hey, if, if it's moist enough and the soil is warm, the seeds that are in that seed bank, a lot of them are very small, will germinate. And so what will germinate? Who knows? You know, you could have seeds that fell onto the ground in 1896, and they've just been under sod for a long, long, long time. And now all of a sudden they get to germinate. You never know what you're going to get. So what happens when we're grazing on a field? We have animals cows most of the time it in my case well i have sheep now too and goats but if you look at their hoofs you look at that hoof couldn't they have been designed more like a converse sneaker couldn't they have you'd think whoever designed them could have done you know made it easier i mean when they walk on concrete they slip you know they get them on a trailer and they slide all over the place why didn't they make them why didn't they design it differently? Well, the shape of that hoof, uh, when, you, when you watch a cow step on the ground, it's, it's got two points. And when they step, 
the sod comes up between them and they actually do this. Right? And if you follow a cow and you look at the sod, they're parting it. Very slightly, but they are parting it. If you get down and you look, you can see it. You can see it. I can see dirt down there. And is that a bad thing? Well, I mean, if you had, if you did it too much, you would turn into all dirt pretty quick if you do it too much. And that's where the farmer comes in, the steward. He's got to make sure that, yeah, I want to graze these cattle, but I got to take care of this field too. So after they've eaten a good share of what's on there off, it's time to move them, right? You can't keep doing that. Even if you move them to another lot and you just start round baling them, you just start giving them hay because then they're making manure for you too. And that's a good thing. But when they do that, they open up that soil and what happens? Oh, you could get some Timothy that sprouts up out of there, a fresh seed or a little seed of alfalfa. Wouldn't that be nice? And your your field starts to fill in you know you never you never need to just plow a field totally you, you never need to do that i know people want to and it's done because uh people feel as though they need to but so long as the field is level enough that you can cut it with your equipment i wouldn't go plowing it up I wouldn't. I would just graze cattle on it. And before you do that, spread some seed. Now, I was going to be spreading 18 yards of, of compost. So I added a bunch of seed to it. And I mixed it up the best I could. And then took it out there and, and, uh, and spread almost all of it. And then I had a malfunction with my spreader and I had to stop. So I am committed to this. I am seeing I am seeing the taking managing manure into a pile and then aerating that pile and then getting smart about how to spread that and getting smart about how to spread other things with it like lime and like you know, there's lots of other you could even I mean, you could put fertilizer in it. You could put a, an organic fertilizer, I suppose. Um, but I'm not going to spend money on that when I don't need to. I get enough kick out of it just the way it is. Um, so to spread it, I need to get smart about how to spread it, right? So I'm I'm trying to protect the microbiology biology that's in that compost. That's what I'm trying to do. I want to protect it. That's why I put biochar in there and I'm going to spread it in full sun on a windy day. Nope. I want to spread it in the evening just before dews coming down. Right. Um, or this time of the year when the sun isn't really intense because the microbiology gets hit by the sun and you're going to lose a lot of them. So your, your job is to protect that biology so my spreader, I built it because I was trying to mim mimic nature. And if you've ever noticed when a cow manures, it leaves a plop. And the designers of the cows could have done other things, right? They could have put a nozzle there that would have sprayed it, right? And atomized it, right? And sprayed it out. And then it would drop down, but they didn't, they didn't do that. They put it so that there's a hole and it pushes out and then it either comes out in lumps or it comes out in, you know, just a, a, a mush. Right. And, you know, we've just watched cows dump our whole lives and thought, well, that's just the way it is. But you never think there's a designed characteristic there. So why are our spreaders aerating the manure or the compost? Why are they aerating it and spreading it very fine? That's not very smart. 
even though our microbiology is very tiny, if we spread it out too far, I think that we're uh, we're opening it, opening it up to the extremes in the weather, whether it's cold, hot, dry, wet, right? When they spray liquid manure on fields, when they're taking the manure and they're they're putting it in water, they're pumping water into lagoons and just it's mush, it's just wet. What do you think that does to the biology? Are those are, are those creatures designed to be drowned? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's why that manure doesn't really do that much when they spray it on the field. You'd think you'd get a whale of a kick out of it. But they spread it on the field and they spread uh, fertilizer on the fields. You, you wouldn't think they'd have to, but they do. So uh, my spreader is a 300-gallon a tank a round cylinder tank that has a tow bar on it. And on that tank, I made a whole bunch of about inch and a half holes, a whole bunch of them, you know, did a pattern all the way around. I cut them out with an oxygen acetylene torch. And as I'm, and then it has a hatch on it, like you'd open it up like a, like a ball tart on a B-17. And you open that up. And you dump compost in that and close it up and strap it down. And then I roll it down the field. I pull it with a tractor because it's pretty heavy, 300 gallons. So that's about a yard. And, um, and it deposits all these small piles uh, where each hole is. You get kind of a dot on the ground. And it's... Uh, about the side, let's say that you cut the end off of a, a cucumber, let's say, and you put that down on the ground. It would be, it looks about like that. So, so there's a little bit of height to it. So it maintains moisture longer. And the, the biology that's in there, I, I believe, is protected. If a seed or two gets in there, I believe it's in a perfect, a perfect environment. Let's say there's a piece of, uh, of uh lime in there too you got a perfect environment for germination and even this time of the year it can happen and if not in the spring we we stand a good chance so i'm setting the field up for long-term success when you do a um, a fertilizer spread it's a short-term thing and it's sort of like taking steroids. You know, you're working out and you want to get all muscular. And uh, so you take steroids. And it's like, wow, this works good. Look at me. But you quit taking those steroids and you start to turn to fluff, right? Turn to turn to nothing. So that's it's a short-term answer to where you're wanting to go. And that's sort of like using a fertilizer deal. So... I guess uh, what I am saying is your composting program is going to be a an ongoing, long-term fix to your fertility woes, and you're you're taking control of it. You have the ability to take control of it. What do you need for composting? A fork. Um, this compost spreader that I have. Uh, a, a woman that I was talking to, I said, well, I, you know, I made this. Well, I, I don't know how to do that. Well, uh, do you know how a shovel works? You know, because if nothing else, you could take it in a wheelbarrow, take it out there and just shovel it. You know, I did that at first before I had the spreader on the front lawn. If any of you come to my house and you come up the, the driveway in front, the sweeping driveway that comes up, notice on your right, you're going to see a thick, just beautiful lawn. Um, when we moved here, it was brown. And we moved here in May. It was brown. And walk out there in bare feet? Nope. You can't do it. Too many cactuses out there. And it would just break apart when you're walking on it. It was just, there was nothing out there. And it really kind of was a turnoff. Um, but hey, I lived out in Montana and that's the way it was out there too. And 
over time of us spreading compost and biochar on there. I did it maybe twice. And then all of a sudden I realized, hey, I got to cut this lawn all the time. And then it, lawn. It used to be, there was a guy I knew way back when I first moved here. And he really irritated me because we had this driveway, but this guy always wanted to drive on the grass. And so he'd be looking at something in my field and he'd drive up the lawn. I'm like, what are you thinking? You know, but then when I went to his house, he didn't have a lawn, didn't have a lawnmower, didn't mean anything to him to see the lawn. And we still deal with people like that. You know, they'll just drive on the grass. It's like, uh, driveway, grass, what's the difference? Right. Um, but now I, I'm at a place where I have to mow the lawn weekly or it just looks horrible. And for the, the sake of the lawn, I want to mow it. And it, you may have seen in some of my other videos, um, you're mowing a lawn, right? And when you get done with it, it looks great. But you just spent three hours doing it and about, you know, $10 worth of fuel and an expensive mower. And gee, are you spending your time the way you should? And plus you're, you're, uh, you're adding to global warming and everything else. Uh, but if you're not just mowing the lawn, let's say you're cutting the grasses off of there, you're collecting them and you're going to make feed out of that grass. Oh, now it's a different story. So I modified my lawnmower so that I could collect the grass in a, in a, in a way that's, that's effective. You know, it works well. And so now I don't even call it mowing the lawn. I'm, I'm harvesting. I'm harvesting because I raise pigs here and I raise chickens and both of them like grass clippings. You know, you can, you can do all kinds of things to doll up grass clippings so that the pigs will just go wild for it. There's so many things you can do. You can put whey on it. You can put, you can mix bread in with it. You can put biochar in it. You can, there's all kinds of things. Today I fed a bunch that uh, sat in the harvester uh, for way too long and I forgot about it. I didn't forget about it. I was just putting it off and I opened it up and whew, stunk. And I thought, they're not going to eat this. It, it, it turned to mush. Oh, you can let it turn to mush. And they liked that mush. The, the pigs ate it all. They fought over the mush. Grass mush. Um, so, so when you start composting your lawn, now all of a sudden you've got a source of feed out of the lawn. Yeah. So compost leads to all kinds of things where you think <sighs> grass clippings where am i going to get rid of these i guess i'll have to buy some bags from home depot so i can put the grass clippings in it and put it out by the road so the trash man can pick it up oh poor me yeah poor you because you're not thinking that those grass clippings have a use on the farmstead that will benefit you Instead of being uh, a liability to you, oh, I got to buy a bag and have the trash man pick it up. Now, all of a sudden, you're like to your neighbor, hey, uh, I'll take your grass clippings. Uh, I don't have that apparatus. Uh, I'll mow your lawn for you. Really? What do you want for it? Um, I don't know. You know, so you start thinking you, 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 could, you could start a... A mowing business. Brian Jacobs has got a mowing business. You could start up a, a lawn care business and feed pigs off of the clippings. And I know somebody's going to say, "Yeah, but some people use fertilizer on their on their lawn. You want to feed that to your pigs?" Oh, come on. Okay. I suppose. I suppose. I suppose. I maybe I'd be careful. Kaleidoscope. I would. Yeah, uh, Kaleidoscope. Okay, wait a minute. McKenna's saying, I work at a cardboard factory. The dust collector feeds my compost along with used bedding. Right on. You know, um, I'm seriously 
looking into a chipper shredder, you know, the kind that you, you can um, cut like up to a six inch tree and it just puts it through. Uh, they make them that will take something like that. It's got, uh, you know, power takeoff. You can hook it on the back of a tractor and I already have a tractor, so it's not a big deal. But then I could go around my property and all these saplings, these uh, um, popple saplings that kind of spring up everywhere, uh, you can clip them off and then you can feed them into the chipper shredder. The chipper shredder will knock them down. And I've proven that if you run that stuff through a hammer mill, you can feed it to the pigs and they will eat it. You can feed it to the chickens and they will eat it. And I, I don't need to send it into the university for them to tell me, oh, no, there's no nutrients in that. I don't believe it. There, I can tell there are nutrients in it because when I take a handful of it and I smell it and then I eat some of it myself, it's like it's not that bad. It's not. I could eat it if I had to. And I know I can. My body is telling me I could. So and then I hand it to the chickens and they they annihilate it. OK, OK, there's a source of feed right there. Now, maybe it wouldn't be complete. Like you're getting from tractor supply. All right. See where I'm going. But it's a it's a starting point. Maybe you could chip up. 50 pounds of popple trees and then add 50 pounds of layer mash to it. Maybe. I mean, it's worth trying, but I think we have to adopt this mindset if we're survivalist farmers, homesteader survivalists, survivalist homesteaders. Okay, Kaleidoscope is asking me, do I mix biochar in my compost? I certainly do. I certainly do. That is a, a real boost. You know, it protects the microbiology, as I've said. Bob Denob, sincere apologies for tardiness. Love your vids. Please keep them going. No problem. Bob Denob. Tim Bins, lawn silage. Right. Okay, you would love. Yeah, Keith Sutton is saying, help me with the thumbs up, you know for the Al Gore rhythms, right? We have a, uh, there's a button on there. You can super chat now too. We have enough people that you can super, you can give me money if you want. You can. Fair trade, I'm giving you information. We have goats and I know they'd eat popple mash. Yeah, they would. Yeah, we tried it with goats too. I have two goats. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. They're actually nice little critters. These ones are, they're just, uh, pygmy goats but they're just little things one of them is nice the other one is skittish and they're just they're just around the farm all the time and they do a couple things that are irritating like they get up on the uh the pool deck we have a an above ground pool so we have a deck you know in this set of stairs you're gonna go up and they go up there and they like to be up there at night because it's high ground and i guess they are scared of the uh, the coyotes that are that are uh, singing all the time, and the dogs can't get to the pool because we don't want the dogs near the pool. So their fence keeps them from there. But the the goats feel safe there, but they're not. They can't be cornered by the dogs because the dogs do chase them because they figure you're not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be in a pen. So. Uh, yeah, so I do have these two little goats. And it's just, I keep thinking about getting rid of them, but they're just so neat to have around, even though they do things that I don't like. But uh, yeah, lawn silage. Uh, what I did is I took the, the vacuum pump off of my trailer that is, is supposed to, you hook it to the discharge on the mower and it's supposed to suck everything up and blow it into the trailer and it works reasonably well it's just that the discharge from the uh the mower deck it's a spiral and if you turn too close it splits 
or it pops off or whatever. I mean, it really limits my mowing capability. And so what I did is I built a bracket to go on the back of the mower and I took the, I, I cut the, uh, the tow bar on the trailer and to, to build this bracket to hold it and then mounted it. Hey, look at that. I got a super chat. Yeah, well, let's see somebody out do Sean Wise. I like to see that. Yeah. And uh, and I mounted it on the back of the tractor, I, on on the back of the mower. And so then I was able to use uh, steel ducting from the discharge on the mower deck to the vacuum. And it's just, it's rigid. It doesn't articulate at all. And it's close in, so I'm, I don't knock it off on trees and stuff. And uh, then my discharge is coming off of the uh, the vacuum discharge, and it's just a six inch duct. And I got a piece of flexible duct at an Army Navy store over in Clare, and it fits on there perfect. And it fills the trailer up. I have a little port on the trailer where I can look in to see how full it is. So I, I made it better, you know, I made the whole thing better and to function better. So what I'm going to do too, is I get junk bread. I get bread that's old. I have a disposal contract with a company around here and I get uh, quite a bit. So I'm going to throw that stuff out on the lawn before I mow. And so the clippings will have chewed up bread in it. And then, you know, your mind goes from there like, well, what else could I put in it? I could infuse biochar into the bread and then I could let it dry and then mow it up, right? What else could I do? Yeah, you really, homesteading done right is a big science project and it's it's really fun. Wow. I got to read some of these things because people are adding some cool stuff. Nine ninety nine US. U.S. dollars from Sean Wise. Thanks, Sean. My pigs are doing good, by the way. My cows and pigs have been killing horse weed, ragweed, and other junk weeds while I let my rye, wheat, clover, and peas go to seed and regerminate my fields. My field exploded, cutting all the seed back in. You know something that you might want to try, just... I don't want to tell you what to do, but if you have cows and you are giving them anything like our milk cows to get them to come in and be happy girls, we give them a scoop of, of grain, you know, there's a little bit of corn in there and some other little goodies for them, whole grains and stuff. And there's a mineral pack in it. So, and, uh, they're not getting a whole bunch. It's just, it, it, it entices them, but um, we can put seed in it, like Timothy seed that's not been treated or orchard grass or whatever like that. And it's a tremendous opportunity because you don't have to put in a whole bunch. You can just, you know, a handful, little in this one, little in this one, little in this one, and that's it. And uh, the way uh, a cow digests, they don't break seeds down. Goats do. They break a lot of them down, not all of them, but a lot of them. But cows break down way less because their their um, their system doesn't have the acids in it that uh, that that pigs and goats have. Um, and so every time they manure, you're you're setting up a little biosphere. Or you could go out there, you know, and there and when they manure, you could just throw a handful right down on top of it. But yeah. Crunchy, fresh goat milk gets $16 a gallon down there. Nothing wrong with goats. No, I guess not. How many goats do you need to get a, a gallon of milk? I don't know. Sean, Jill's saying thanks, Sean, for the for the $9.99. Yeah, thanks. All of you should look at that. that Super chat. You, I bet you feel good about yourself now, Sean, don't you? I bet you do. It just gives you a good feeling, doesn't it? Knowing that you 
this is good for America. This information is good for America. So, you know, in a way, it's a patriotic thing to give me money. The bread on the lawn is a great idea. Yeah. I use my zero turn bagger for my cuttings, can handle six foot horse, horse weed when I make it. All right. Horse weed. I'm not familiar with that one. I tell you what, I had a, uh, yeah, see, Sean's agreeing with me. He feels good. You feel good about yourself, don't you? Good. Darn it. Um, we had uh, an outbreak this year of what's called Jimson weed. Jimson weed. Um, and uh, I never saw it so bad. Um, oh, Sean, you have goats now. I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Um, okay, we'll have to talk on the phone. Um, and this Jimson weed grew so quickly, and the coverage was so complete. And I ignored it for a while, and hoping that it was just going to... And it was multiplying. And so I went out... In years past, I've just gone out with a, a scythe and cut it. And uh, and so this year, I I got some defoliant from Tractor Supply. I got like a, a Roundup type thing, and I put it in a sprayer and went around and sprayed each plant. And uh, it looked like it wasn't going to work, but... In the meantime, when I thought it wasn't going to work, I looked at the packages and there's this thing called 2,4-D, which uh, was one of the main ingredients in uh, Agent Orange. Remember that stuff. And so I got some of that and I remember that smell, boy. It's just not that I was involved in Agent Orange, but I know that 2,4-D smell. And uh, so I started using that. And I would spray each plant individually, and it would just ew, wilt them. And I think that's going to be a process now for a few years. I'm going to have to really bear down on that Jimson weed because it can totally take over. And where it came from, we have no idea. Uh, it's in like three fields and there doesn't seem to be a common denominator except their fields that do get tilled but it grew in areas that don't get tilled too so there didn't seem to really be like a oh it only grew where the pigs were rooting around no nope. that's not that's not the case i had some that actually came up at the uh the burn pile we've got a place where we you know, if we have any stuff that we can't utilize and it's just burn it, you know, we have a place where we burn and, and the Jimson weed came up over there. So, yeah, I wasn't real happy about having to do that, but okay. One La Mancha goat makes about a gallon a day. Hmm. Okay. We have Nigerian dwarf goats, and milking four would get you about a gallon. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sean's, Sean doesn't. The neighbors do. Okay, well, we can still be friends. So a lot of people think I don't like goats, but I, you know, the people think I don't like Amish either, but I don't. I just, I just make fun of them, that's all. Because they have, they're quirky. You know, goats are quirky. Amish are quirky. And I just... You know, we're not supposed to notice those quirks, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Just because they dress in black and drive buggies, <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm not going to point out their quirks. All right. Well, uh, good night tonight. Um, Kaleidoscope, did you let anyone borrow your equipment? Weeds may have come from there. No, I did not. I did not. No, these are in fields that... Um, Nope, I didn't. And, you know, it's not the whole field. It's just very localized in, like, small areas. We can do it cheaper. Yeah, that's 
to my invitation and the Amish. I got Amish friends. They're 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 good chaps. Fun to laugh. It's just the the way you know the way certain people treat them. And it's like usually liberal white chicks, you know? Like I don't know, they just have a way about them. They just they see it and they just think it's so it's different and it's so much better. I mean, look at the the environment. Their their horses are crapping on the road. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? And then you drive through it and it sprays all over your car. Isn't that nice? Oh yeah, it's good for the environment. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have a great night from Gladwin. My first time catching. Okay, Tim Bins. We're uh, kind of net, kind of neighbors. Gladwin's a cool town. It's a wicked. It's a wicked potty town. They potty over there like crazy in in Gladwin. They're, they're, they're pottying over there all the time. It's a wicked potty town. Okay, they got the Amish over there, and they're pottying all the time. They love to potty, them Amish. All right, I got to get going. I uh, got a lot going this week. Um, for those of you who are not Tribe Plus members, if you were a Tribe Plus member, then you would be welcome to come to our consulting call tomorrow night. A co consulting call is different than this. Uh, this is what I get to talk about what I want to talk about on this, but um, the consulting call is, this is where I demonstrate that I know my stuff, but the consulting call is where you get to say, hey, I've got this situation, how should I handle this? And it is a paid consulting thing because it, it it's part of the Tribe Plus membership. We have a consulting call every other week on Wednesday night and it's a lot of fun and it's supposed to be only an hour, but usually we go to, I've been a little stingy with my time lately. Um, because, okay, I might as well talk about this. Um, this deal that's going on like about tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, the 4th, October 4th, remember, uh, the 23rd, you know, I got a cell phone. I see all this stuff. I'm not going to make believe I don't see it. And, um, you know, tomorrow uh, there's going to be a tone. And anybody who took the you-know-what is going to turn into a zombie. So make sure you're – that's dumb. That's dumb. But people are saying that. And I think most likely what it is, is just a continuation of what we have been living through for a long time now. It didn't start with the Wu flu. It did not. It started, I, it goes back to, okay, in my lifetime, um, it goes back to uh, the Apollo pa spaceship program, okay? So the lunar lander looks like a fort made by meth heads. You know, it, it you couldn't even sleep out in it, never mind land on the on the moon, right? And and we were told, oh, this we're landing on the moon. And you know, I believe that I was nine years old back then, and 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 on and on and on and go, it goes. There's always something that they're showing you or telling you or scaring you with to keep you moving in the direction that they want. Okay. Okay. Now you can, you can believe it all and go in that direction and you'd be on your fifth or sixth booster by now. And, or you could say, well, I'm just not going to go in that direction. I'm going to go the other direction. And then you're still kind of in the spell or you can just disconnect and disconnect from it. And then look at it in the rear view mirror and say, what are they trying to do here? And and then it becomes apparent what they're trying to do. It's they're trying to herd you, trying to farm you. And when you when you see it and you're able to actually look at it and kind of chuckle at it, then it doesn't have you. It doesn't have you under control. And I used to be into all that stuff. I used to want to tell everybody, you know, about, hey, look at this, you know. 
jets flying into buildings. Well, that doesn't make buildings fall down. You know, we, we can't even do that with the best weapons that we have. You know, I want to tell everybody, you're falling into it. You can't stop what they're going to do because they'll 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 stop at nothing. They'll just up the ante, you know. If everybody knows, so you're better off just breaking away and doing your own thing. Now, if they do something and and it really affects you, like you live in Chicago and they nuke the place, well, you're out of luck. You're out of luck. But those of us that have chosen this lifestyle, we're not going to live in Chicago. We're we're living. Out in the perimeter, yeah, we, we don't have all the cool stuff, but we're finding out that the cool stuff is more control measures. And they centralize it in the cities because they can control that group of people. Well, out here in the perimeter, they don't care about us. They really don't. I mean, I think that's part of it, too, is people fall into they're watching everything you do. No, they're not. They don't care. They've got the mass of people in the population centers. And that's what they want. They're farming them, right? Out here in the perimeter, you guys want to live out in the perimeter? Go ahead. They don't care about you guys. They don't. So I say just kind of walk away from the whole thing. Uh, I'm curious to see what's going to happen on the 4th. But if it doesn't happen on the 4th, it's going to happen on the 11th. Come on. It's all about control and tyranny and fear because everything that they do. Are, do you actually think that they're going to test this out because, oh, if there's a problem, we're going to want to let the people know there's a problem. Oh, yeah, right. If you If you haven't figured out, our government is not into that. You know, you get in government and then you start padding your nest. And that's what they do. They do it at every single level. You know, not all of them, not all of them, but, you know, mostly. Right. So that's why when you have a complaint about something, it usually it's like, oh, yes, let me write this down. And as soon as you're done talking, they chuck it. They don't care about doing fixing any of that stuff. So <clears throat> I'm not saying nothing ever happens. Sometimes you get help from government, but most of the time you don't. And so you just have to create your own shtick, your own thing, your own little place, and be content with the things that should be making you content. If you're not content because you don't get to see, you know, Bruce Jenner playing uh, women's um, tennis, then your contentment meter is need, needs to be calibrated. You should be really learn to be content with good food, warm place to stay, and your work. And then even get smarter about it and start dropping things off. You know, I don't even need a warm place to stay. I'm content sleeping in the cold. I'm not yet. But I I uh, I started cold plunging. I'll tell you this. I started cold plunging a few years ago. And at first, it really brought the inflammation down in my my body. I didn't know how inflamed it was, but the food that I was eating definitely was inflaming me. And from years of uh, eating all the stuff that I was eating, you know, I was a lot of inflammation. I went carnivore and a lot of inflammation dropped off, but I keep doing the plunging, the cold plunging. So that's where you, you go in cold water in the morning, like ice cold. And <clears throat> lately I've been craving it like I, and I can't explain it but um, it's still uncomfortable getting in but once I'm in I just like I'm staying I want to live here in the cold and you know I, I get to the okay I get bored of being cold and then I get out and I wow does it feel good so I th I think there's a lot of things like that that we just need to explore, you know, the, the cold being your friend. Okay. Turn off your phone between two and four. I'm not going to, I want to hear that I have to say, because I'm not afraid of it. If you turn it off, they got you. They got you. Yeah. I'm not, I just, 
I'm just not playing. You know, I'm just not playing the game. And the whole political thing, it's fun sometimes to listen to. Like they, they nailed the Speaker of the House today. All right. That's fun. It's like if the Red Sox win. I'm from that area, so it's, oh, okay, Red Sox won. But that doesn't change my day-to-day. It doesn't change it. All right, tinfoil hat. You know, they, they make fun of that, right, the tinfoil hat thing. But I bet you they make fun of it because it's probably something to it. You know, like the mainstream, oh, have you got your tinfoil hat on? <laughs> Oh, you must be a flat earther, right? Even the president will make fun of people who are not convinced that we live on a on a round earth, you know? And I'm not anymore, right? There's just way too much evidence that always has been, but we never kind of thought that why would they lie to us, right? Why would they lie to us about that? There's there's reasons for all of that lying, right? I just, just in my, in my previous business, two words, Coriolis effect. And if you look into the Coriolis effect and then you realize, Hey, we never even use the Coriolis effect. We never even factor that in when we're doing any kind of targeting or anything like that. None of it, even flying, we don't do it. Coriolis effect. And that's where the earth is rotating. So if you're flying North, you'd have to keep have to keep easing her to the west to stay on course because the earth is moving under you or if you fire artillery or whatever you know and it's just you never really even take it into you never take it into effect into account on any of those things so that's what tips it over for me all right i'll see you guys remember anyone can farm